Welcome back to Genetics on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to do a dihybrid cross example, and I recommend that you either uh, hopefully know about Punnett squares slash monohybrid crosses or go back and watch the video on that before looking at this because these dihybrid crosses are a little bit more challenging conceptually and they're an extension of the monohybrid crosses that we did in the previous video. So please make sure you do that. Well, if you're ready, we're going to talk about dihybrid crosses. All right, so like I said in the previous video, we talked about Punnett squares. And in general, Punnett squares, usually we're referring to a monohybrid cross. Sometimes those terms are used interchangeably. And what the Punnett square allows you to do is it allows you to predict all the possible genotypes and phenotypes of the offspring given the mating between a mother and a father. Okay? Because as we know, the father is going to donate a sperm and the mother is going to donate an egg also known as an oocyte. Okay? And those two gametes, the egg and the sperm, are going to combine and you're going to get fertilization in the zygote. Right? Okay? Now, when we did it with a monohybrid cross, we're just looking at it with one gene. I think in that example, we'll use the classic example, just A, okay? You're just looking at one gene. And remember, uh, either in that video, or maybe you know this from previous things in your course, every human has two copies of every gene. So you have a gene for, uh, let's say, an enzyme in glycolysis. So the first enzyme in glycolysis is hexokinase. You have two copies of the gene for that enzyme. You have two copies of every single gene, because let's think about it. You've got two copies of chromosome 1. Every person has two copies of chromosome 2, two copies of chromosome 3, and so on and so forth. So every gene you have two copies of. Also remember that the sperm that's manufactured by the father, those sperm only have one copy of that gene. Okay, They only have one copy. Now, how do, how do you know which of the two copies of the father's gene went to the sperm? Well, the answer is you don't. You don't know which of them happened, so you have to count for all of them. And the same thing's true of the mother. The mother has two copies of every gene, but the egg only has one copy of that gene. How do you know which of those two genes from the mother went to, into the egg? The answer is you don't. We're assuming it's random, and so you have to account for all cases. Now, like we said, in monohybrid crosses, you're only dealing with one gene. Dihybrid crosses, you're now dealing with two. And so it's not as simple as just writing on the up here on the horizontal AA, down here AA. Okay? We actually have to account for every possible combination of fertilization so we can get all the possible genotypes. And so I've got maternal up here on the top. So we're actually going to start with the maternal genotype. This is the genotype of the mother, uh, considering both her A genes and B genes. And in this example, um, you'll see this in a few minutes when we go to the next slide, A is going to be the gene for height, so either tall or short. B is going to be the gene for speed, fast or slow. Okay, I just made it off, off the top of my head. So what we have to do is account for every possibility, every combination of each of these two A's with each of these two B's. And so I've got the mother's genotype right here, A, big A, little A, big B, little B. And I've color coded it, so we have to make every possible combination. Let's start with blue. So we're going to cross, or sort of combine, I should say, big A with big B. So big A, big B's right here in blue. Then what about green? Big A with little b, so big A, little b, okay? Now we have to go to the, the small a, so little a, big b, so in orange, little a, big b, and then in red, little a, little b, little a, little b over here. So what I've done there is I've made every possible combination of these two a's with these two b's. And what will happen is in each of each time you do that, so this will happen for the mother like we just did, and it'll also happen for the father, there's going to be four of them. And sometimes they can be the same, as we'll see in just a minute. So that's your mother combinations. So potentially one of her eggs could be big A, big B, one of her eggs could be big A, little b, and so on and so forth. So these represent the four possibilities of egg genotypes given just genes A and B. All right, what about for the father? His genotype is big A, big A, 
little b, little b. Remember, he's got two copies of every gene. Let's make the same combination. So in blue, we can combine big A with little b. So in blue, big A, little b. In green, we can combine big A with little b. Green, big A, little b. And you'll see actually for the orange and the red, we're actually going to get the same things um, as up here. So orange, we're going to have big A, little b. Red, we're also going to have big A, little b. Again, you can follow these arrows. And so now at this point, what I've done is I've set up the, uh, the outline of my dihybrid cross. And so now what I can do at this point is I can determine all the possible genotypes. And the way I'm going to do that is in a very similar manner to how I did it with the monohybrid cross. Except instead of having four cells in here, I'm going to have 16 because it's four by four. So what I've done now is I've gone ahead and I filled in, I filled in all of these, okay? And I just made every possible combination. So for example, if I'm doing this first cell, it's going to be a cross between big A, little b, which is the sperm genotype, and big A, big B, which is this particular egg genotype. So I'm going to put the A's together, big A, big A. So I've got big A, big A. And now put the B's together, big B, little b. So big B, little b. Okay, now what this means just in terms of this cell right here is I've got, or this potential offspring, I should be very specific in this problem, this offspring will have the genotype big A, big A, which is homozygous dominant for uh, the height, and then big B, little b is heterozygote, but it's going to have the same phenotype as the homozygous dominant for the speed gene. Okay, so in this case, big A, big A, that's going to be tall, and big B, little b is heterozygote, but that's still going to be phenotypically fast. Okay? In order to be slow, it would have to be little b, little b, homozygous recessive. And actually what you'll find is because all the paternal uh, genotypes for the sperm are the same, this pattern is going to continue down this column. So if I do this one, this cell right here, the green AB with this blue AB right here, Combine the A's, big A, big A, so big A, big A. Now combine the B's, big B, little b, big B, little b. And so this offspring will have the same genotype as the one above it, and also the same phenotype as a result. And like I said, you can do this for the other two below it. They're going to be exactly the same as well. All right. Now let's find the, the genotype and phenotype of this offspring right here in this cell where my mouse is. So we're going to be crossing big A little b, that sperm genotype, with big A little b, this egg genotype. All right, so combine the A's, big A, big A, so big A, big A, and now combine the B's, little b, little b, so little b, little b. Now, this is a different genotype than what we just saw to the left of it. Um, the A is the same genotype, but overall it's going to be different because uh, the B is now homozygous recessive. So the A is still homozygous dominant, so it's still going to be tall, but little b, little b is homozygous recessive. That's going to be phenotypically slow, okay? And I challenge you to determine this for yourself, but if you actually cross this particular egg, big A, little b, with any of these sperm genotypes, you're going to get the same thing as we just got. So big A, big A, little b, little b. So all the genotypes are going to be the same, and then also the phenotypes are also going to be the same in this column. It's going to be tall and slow. Okay. If we go to the third column right here, uh, this egg is going to be little a, big B. Okay. And so if we cross that with uh, this sperm cell, big A, little b, we're going to first combine the A's. So it's going to be big A, little a, so that's big A, little a. And then if we cross the B's, big B, little b, it's going to be big B, little b. Now, phenotypically, because these are both heterozygotes, these, this column is going to end up being the same phenotype as that of column one. But notice the genotype is technically different. Because the genotype is different because in the third column, the A is going to be heterozygous. And in the first column, it's homozygous dominant. So even though the phenotypes are actually the same between columns one and three, the genotypes are actually going to be different, and we'll account for that in a minute. Okay? Then for the last column, we're going to be combining the egg, which is genotypically little a, little b, with the sperm, which we know by now is big A, little b. All right? 
So we combine the A's, big A, little a, big A, little a. Now combine the B's, little b, little b, little b, little b. Okay, and again, I challenge you to do this on your own, but you'll see that all of them in this column are gonna be the same. Okay, so we're gonna have big A, little a, and then little b, little b. And so in the case of the A's, the A gene, the offspring's gonna be heterozygous for height, which in this case is tall phenotypically, okay? Now, for the speed aspect, gene B, they're all gonna be homozygous recessive, okay? And so homozygous recessive for speed, in this case, gives you the phenotype of slow, okay? Now, oftentimes what you'll be asked in dihybrid cross problems is you'll be asked to determine uh, the genotypic ratio and the phenotypic ratio. So basically what you're gonna be doing is for the, for the genotype ratio is you're gonna count basically the total number of each of the genotypes, okay? Each of the unique genotypes. So we know in this column right here, this first column, we have big A, big A, little b, little b. Do we have any other columns that have that genotype? Well, no, we don't have any other columns that have exactly this genotype. So this is gonna be a unique genotype in this column, and there's four of them, right? So let me actually get rid of this. There's four of them. So there's four of this genotype right here, okay? What about the second column? Well, these are all the same in this column. Are there any other, uh, geno any other columns that have this exact genotype? Well, again, the answer is no. This, in this column at least, is a unique genotype, so there's four of those. One, two, three, four. And what you'll find is that actually in this example, each column here is a unique genotype. So for example, on the fourth column over here on the far right, this big A, little a, little b, little b, no other column has this genotype. So in fact, every one of these columns is a unique genotype. There's four of each. So the genotype is four to four to four to four, okay? Because there's four that have the genotype big A, big, big A, big B, little b. There's four that have the genotype big A, big A, little b, little b. There's four that have, you know, and so on and so forth. So genotypically, the ratio is four to four to four to four. All right. And what some, some uh, sources will say to do is actually to reduce this into its lowest common or its empirical ratio. Because each of these numbers is divisible by four, you could reduce this to one to one to one to one. Okay, um, you should go with whatever your teacher or professor says to do in this case, okay? But one to one to one to one is the empirical ratio because it's reduced as much as possible. Now, let's worry about the phenotypic ratio. Now, I've already written the phenotypes down here. Let's look for unique phenotypes. Well, this first column is tall and fast. And we see in this column, there's four of those. Are there any other columns that have tall and fast? Well, yes, there is. The third column has tall and fast, right? So here's a fifth one, six, seven, eight. So actually, in terms of, in terms of phenotype, there's eight of them that have tall and fast phenotypes, okay? Now, let's go to the second column. These are tall and slow. That's definitely unique from tall and fast. Has to be exactly the same. Tall and slow, there's four in this column that are tall and slow. Are there any other columns that have tall and slow? Well, yes, this one does. Tall and slow, there's four more in this column. So there's actually eight total that are uh, tall and slow. So there's eight that are tall and fast, eight that are tall and slow, and there's no other combinations that we have. And again, just like in the case of the genotype, uh, you'll have to check with your teacher or professor to see what they want, but you can actually reduce this phenotypic ratio to one to one, okay? And so that's how you determine the genotypic and phenotypic ratios. Now, I want to emphasize one other thing um, about these dihybrid crosses. You won't always have the case where the sperm, in this case the paternal, were all the same genotype. Um, you won't always have a case where all all the cells, or I should say offspring, in one column are the same, or all in the row are the same. Um, they can be very different. In fact, um, some of the common dihybrid crosses that you'll see actually have a genotype ratio of things like uh, 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Okay, um, There's a lot of different ratios you can have, but in general what you're going to be doing to determine the genotypic ratio and the phenotypic ratio is you're going to add up all the unique genotypes, 
and then you're going to add up all the unique phenotypes, okay, and just express it as a ratio like one of these. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense, and that's how you perform a dihybrid cross. Um, we'll do another example in another video uh, where we'll actually get a different combination and different genotypic and phenotypic ratios. So hopefully you enjoyed this video and learned a lot. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.